Good morning, I'm Bill Combs. I'm the rector here, in case you don't know who I might be, and I just wanted to take a moment to catch folks up on some news from the diocese this past week. On, on Thursday, we found out, uh, well, there are new protocols that were released, 34 pages of new protocols. So this was a, a lengthy document. Among that um, was the notification that we no longer will be able to sing during our live streaming services. And we will not be having processionals either. And I guess that's not too surprising, really, when, uh, the, when the diocese back in late May, early June, was talking about having us come back to in-person services. That was a part of the plan, that we would, um, that we would not be having singing, but we would have more of us in here. <laughs> and uh, then when the surge happened in June, that all got kind of tabled. That document was called for planning purposes only, and so I treated it as such. And so until this most recent release of protocol, that's what we've been doing. And now we go forward. At home, you'll be doing exactly what you've been doing. You'll be singing along with the music that's provided by Jenny. We'll have our hymns here. We'll be humming along with you. And I really encourage you to sing. I encourage you to let the text rise up in you. I encourage you to let the music flow over you, to engage. It doesn't matter how good it might be or how bad you might think it is. It's our offering to God. You all heard me in March and in April trying to sing along as Emily accompanied me with one, one hand. It's what we offer God. It's what we do. It's what we do as best we can. God knows that. God sees that. God loves you. There's nothing <laughs> that you need to be embarrassed about at all. So let us praise God with worship and praise. After a moment of silence, we'll have our gathering hymn, which is hymn number 522, three verses of that, verses 1, 2, and 4. of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you 
and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. But for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep us in the eternal life. Amen. 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 Kill him. But if it is a girl, she shall live. 
But the midwives feared God. They did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them. But they let the boys live. So the king of Egypt went to summon the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this and allowed the boys to live? The midwives said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women. For they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. So God dealt well with the midwives. And the people multiplied and became very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, Every boy that is born to the Hebrews you shall throw into the Nile, but you shall let every girl live. Now a man from the house of Levi went and married a Levitic woman. The woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was a fine baby, she hid him three months. When she could hide him no longer, she got a pampas basket for him and plastered it with vitamin and pitch. She put the child in it and placed it among the reeds on the banks of the river. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. The daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river while her attendants walked beside the river. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her maid to bring it. When she opened it, she saw the child. He was crying and she took pity on him. This must be one of the Hebrew children, she said. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and get you a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Yes. So the girl went and called the child's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child and nurse it for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed it. When the child grew up, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and she took him as her son. She named him Moses, because she said, I drew him out of the water. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us stay together the psalm appointed for today. If the Lord had not been on our side, let Israel now say, If the Lord had not been on our side, when enemy who rose up against us, then would they have swallowed us up alive, and the fierce anger towards us. Then would the waters have overwhelmed us, and the torrent have gone over us. Then would the raging waters have gone right over us. Blessed be the Lord. He has not given us over to be afraid for their teeth. We have escaped like a bird from the snare of the flower. The snare is broken, and we have escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of the heaven and earth. Second lesson from Romans. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. As in one body, we have many members, and not all the members have the same function. So we, who are many, are one body in Christ. And individually, we are members one of another. We have the gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, prophecy, in proportion to faith, ministry, in ministering the teacher in teaching, the exhorter in exhortation, the giver in generosity, the leader in diligence, the compassionate in cheerfulness. The word of the Lord. 
Thanks be to God. Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound on in heaven, and whatever you loose in earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he stormed the order sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord, Lord Christ. Christ. Please be seated. But who do you say that I am? This little sojourn into Caesarea Philippi is for Jesus and his disciples a journey into identity. This region was for hundreds of years devoted to the Greek god Pan. Strolling past Panian temples, 
surrounded by what is foreign and alien, Jesus asks his followers about identity. These are not light questions. We are given here the central questions of our Christian walk. If you were to ignore the chapter numbers and the verse numbers and just lay out Matthew's Gospel, verse by verse by verse, you would find that this passage is very near the very center of it. All leads to this question, all leads away from it. But who do you say that I am? Now there's a question before this. It's, it's a warm-up. It's a, a lead-in, kind of a softball. Who do the people say that the Son of Man is? This is about the rumors, the product of spin doctors, the gist of the hopes and wishes of those who caught a whiff of Jesus but don't really know him. It's not an intimate question about himself. In fact, Jesus even refers to himself in the third person by a title, Son of Man. And the answers reflect speculation and hearsay. Ah, uh, Elijah, some folks say John the Baptist, maybe some have said Jeremiah or some other prophet. They sound like guesses. The uncertain grasping of those who hope for the return of what already has been. But who do you say that I am? Now this question makes demands. This question insists that the one asked go beyond supposition, that they respond with what they know to be true through their close relationship with Jesus. These disciples have been called to Jesus. They've been living with Jesus. They have walked with him. They have eaten with him. They have slept by his side. Peter's response is intimate and vulnerable. He just kind of blurts it out. It's spontaneity itself. He says what he knows in his inmost being to be true. You're the Christ. You're the anointed one, the son of the living God. It's the foundation for all that follows. It's the foundation for all who follow. Peter's response to this question reveals as much about him as it does about Jesus. Perhaps it reveals even more. And here's what makes this question the axis of the gospel, the center about which everything else spins. Jesus is not asking, who am I? Rather, he is asking, who is the you who follows me? How am I revealed in you and your life? In essence, Jesus is asking, who are you with me alive in you, with you? It's the core question of relationships. Who do you say I am? Asks, how am I bound to you? How am I reflected in you? How am I revealed in you? Who do you say that I am? It's not simply a question of who is Jesus, but also a question of how that understanding is spoken into being by those of us who follow him. Many years ago, this is maybe in the late 90s, my wife and I would go down to the cathedral every Wednesday and we would have uh, the Holy Eucharist at 5 o'clock, a meal at 6 o'clock, and then there was a class that would happen at 7 o'clock. And one, one, uh, one particular Wednesday, uh, while we were sitting and having our meal, one of the priests came up, a woman named Elizabeth Rector, very important person in my formation, probably the most important person during that point in my life. And she came up, now Elizabeth is usually very reserved. But she came up and she was a little flushed, a little excited. And she sat down at our table and we asked her, what's up? And she leans in and she says, I've had a revelation. It's all about articulating the faith. Yeah, articulate the faith. And she turns off and she leaves. One of the stranger interactions I've ever had is I always would remember it. Our Gospels tell us that what we receive in Christ is Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Who do you say I am asks us, what are you doing with that Word? How are you articulating Jesus in your life and in the world? The root of that word articulate means to be jointed. 
A non-articulated arm would be one without an elbow or a shoulder or a wrist. A non-articulated arm is one-dimensional, rigid, stiff. Whereas the articulated arm is more facile, more agile, more effective in three dimensions. In the same way, to articulate our faith is to give faith facility. To express who Jesus is, not only through words, but through our relationships, our actions, our prayers, our very lives. Which leads back to this question of identity. Who is the you? As our reading from Paul this morning so wonderfully notes, each of us is made up of a wonderful constellation of gifts, ready to be harnessed for the work of articulating Christ in the world. And to the extent that we're able to discover the scope of our giftedness, the beauty of our multi-jointed and facile selves, and to articulate Christ through those gifts, will be the extent that we discover and live out of our true selves, rather than our false self. The false self, most simply put, is that which seeks its own satisfaction above any other, even God. This is opposed to our true selves, which is who we are, living fully out of the power of God's love dwelling within us. My true self seeks to harness my gifts and talents and resources to live out loving God and neighbor with every ounce of my being. One may call this authentic living, living as God has authored us to be, as God has created us to be. My false self seeks to harness my gifts, talents, resources, to manipulate God and neighbor to meet my own selfish needs. And we all have this true self, false self dichotomy within us. And our identity comes from the extent to which one overcomes the other. If I proclaim both my mouth, Christ is Lord, to live my life as if power, wealth, reputation is my God, then I am no different from an arm that has no shoulder or a wrist, but only a very arthritic elbow. It's very painful to move. I'm almost completely living out of satisfying my false self, the false me that has nothing at all to do with God or God's will. This is the opposite of authentic living. I'm living my life other than the way God has created me to be. Maybe we might think about it in a different way. <clears throat> Let us return to that image of God as word. God first speaks, and we respond. In our response, we reflect back what God invokes. God is voice. We are echo. Maybe it's even more than that. Thomas Burton, the Trappist monk, writes about authentic living, living out of the true self. <clears throat> he describes this as contemplation, and contemplation is where having living out of that center with God at our very core. This contemplation, this authentic living, is a response to a call, he writes. A call from him who has no voice, and yet who speaks in everything that is, and who, most of all, speaks in the depths of our own being. For we ourselves are words of his, but we are words that are meant to respond to him, to answer to him, to echo him. Authentic living is this echo. It's a deep resonance in the inmost center of our spirit in which our very life loses its separate voice and resounds with the majesty and mercy of the living God. God answers himself in us. And this answer is divine life, divine creativity, making all things new. God asks a question, and in awakening us to authentic living, God answers the question. So that one is at the same time, question and answer. You and I, we're question and answer. Merton employs the language used by all the mystics over the last 2,000 years who have noted that to grow in relationship with God is to become one with our Lord. Voice and echo are intended to blend and become one. But who do you say that I am? It is a question that makes great demands. 
If ever you're looking for a guiding question in your spiritual journey, well, here it is. You may want to reframe it to suit your particular situation. Am I an arthritic one-jointed limb? Or a multi-jointed articulator of life and love? Is my echo God's word? To what extent do I mute and diminish God's voice? In truth, perhaps this question of Jesus can only be answered in the full echo and articulation of our lives. When we share our resources with those without, especially in the midst of this pandemic, even if we don't want to, even if we don't like him very much, we say, Jesus is generosity and abundance. When we forgive those who wound us and tell them our truth and listen to theirs, we echo Jesus' reconciliation and love. When we let go of hatred and enmity and every form of death, we say Jesus' is resurrection and the source of new life. When we use our God-given gifts to strengthen the weak and give hope to the forlorn, we say Jesus is wholeness and healing. When we join in prayer and worship, when eventually we might even regather at this table, we say Jesus is communion and community, the joy of love. We do speak Jesus in our lives, and it is a joy to witness and behold. May we continue to do so, and in so doing, we become articulate. May we become both echo and voice, that in us and through us, the world may know what Peter came to know. Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. It is spoken to the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. In peace we pray to you, Lord God. For all people in their daily life and work. For our families, friends, and neighbors. And for those, and for those who are alone. For this community, the nation, and the world. For all, for all who work for justice, freedom, freedom, and peace. For the just and proper use of your creation. For the victims of hunger, fear, injustice, and oppression. 
for all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble. For those who minister to the sick, the friendless, and the needy. For the peace and unity of the Church of Christ. For all who proclaim the gospel, and all who seek the truth. For Michael, our presiding bishop, and Robert, Don, and Paul, our bishops, and for all bishops and other ministers. For all who serve God in his church. church. For the special needs and concerns of this congregation, especially Barb, Lisa, Mark, Wendy, Rick, Jeff, Cheryl, Beth, Evelyn, Stan, Martha, Gino, Lynn, Joel, Ruby, Faith, Liz, Art, Dana. The victims of the storm in the Midwest and the fires in the western U.S. Those affected by the coronavirus, those on the Redeemer prayer list, and those we name either alive or silent. Yeah. And we pray for all who are suffering in the isolation of this pandemic. Those whose families are not near, those who live alone. Those who live with depression or anxiety. Those who are experiencing a crisis of their faith. Those who are experiencing grief of any kind. That they may find comfort, healing, and peace from your indwelling spirit. Hear us, Lord. For your mercy is great. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life. We give you thanks for those celebrating the anniversary of their birth, remembering especially Rebecca McRobbie and Scott Ch Chesbro, and those celebrating the anniversary of their marriage, remembering especially Katie and Kurt Price. We will exalt you, O God, our King. And praise your name forever and ever. We pray for all who have died, remembering this especially Charlotte Waters and Jane Drake and Aunt Stan Molesky, that they may have a place in your eternal kingdom. Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them. And put their, their trust in you. In you. O oh Lord our God, accept the fervent prayers of your people. In the multitude of your mercy, look with compassion upon us and all who turn to you for help. For your gracious, O oh lover of souls, and to you we give glory, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now let us greet one another in God's peace. May the peace of the Lord be always with you and also with you. God's peace. Yeah, and just a few announcements here. First of all, an apology about what happened last week during our live streaming. Um, yours truly forgot to plug in the laptop, and it went out about the very end of the sermon. I watched the screen just go black, and I thought, what? what in the world? Only later did I realize what I had done. I apologize for that. We're all plugged in today. Uh, just a word of thanksgiving to the folks who've helped to support our soup and sandwich Saturdays. We had yesterday um, 12 individuals fed, seven different households, and um, very, very grateful for all the help that you are giving in that. Um, the survey that is from the diocese, this COVID-19 um, survey, we're going to have the deadline on that on Monday, so please fill that out. There are details about that in our bulletin if you've not had a chance to do that. And finally, somebody asked me, why don't we just have our, our, our prayers for our birthdays and anniversaries when we have those? And I thought, well, why not? <laughs> so why don't, why don't we do that now? I forgot to, to, for our folks who are gathered here, 
I forgot to print this off as a part of your bulletin, so I apologize, but I'll lead us, and for folks who are at home, you pray along with me. We're going to be praying for Re Rebecca McRobbie and for Scott Chesbro for their birthday, and for Everett and Katie Price, who are celebrating their 45th anniversary today. So congratulations to them. These gorgeous flowers are um, provided by them in the glory of God and in honor and celebration of that anniversary. I will guide us in our first prayer, prayer of the birthday blessing. <clears throat> for folks here, you may know these words well enough to say them with me. Watch over your children, O Lord, as their days increase. Bless and guide them wherever they may be. Strengthen them when they stand. Comfort them when scourged or sorrowful. Raise them up if they fall. And in their hearts may your peace, which passes understanding, abide all the days of Rebecca's and Scott's life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 And forever in Katie, we thank you, most gracious God, for the marriage of Everett and Katie. Bless and uphold their life together, and let their love be a reflection of your love in Jesus Christ. Lead them further in companionship with each other and with you. Give them grace to live together in love and fidelity, with care for one another. Strengthen them all their days and bring them to that holy table where, with those they love, they will feast forever in your heavenly home. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. And now in the spirit of celebration and thanksgiving, let us continue with the general thanksgiving. Accept, O Lord, our thanks and praise for all that you have done for us. We thank you for the splendor of the whole creation, for the beauty of this world, for the wonder of life, and for the mystery of love. We thank you for the blessing of family and friends, and for the loving care which surrounds us on every side. We thank you for setting us at tasks which demand our best efforts, and for leading us to accomplishments which satisfy and delight us. We thank you also for those disappointments and failures that will lead us to acknowledge our dependence on you alone. Above all, we thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, for the truth of his word and the example of his life, for steadfast obedience by which he overcame temptation, for his dying, through which he overcame death, and for his rising to life again, and in which we are raised to the life of your kingdom. Grant us the gift of your Spirit, that we may know Christ and make him known, and through him at all times and in all places, may give thanks to you in all things. Amen.
hearts and minds the knowledge and love of God and of God's Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you now and remain with us always. Amen. Amen. And now go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. God.